everyone, I'm Carly Vigna, and this is episode 305 of At Percussion. With me, as usual, are Casey Cangelosi. Hey, Casey. Hey, what's up, Carly? Casey, can we take a second and just brag about how beautiful Virginia is right now? Oh, yeah. This is the time of the season I mentioned probably a month or two ago. It's, uh, yeah, they need to... They need to figure out how to genetically alter trees so they stay like this year round. It seems like there's a lot of money in that and no one's figured that out. It's like, yeah, somebody can get on that. It's super beautiful. It's like perfect, perfect weather. It's nice. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And Ben Charles is here too. Hey, Ben. Hey, Carly. How are you? Good, good, good. Hey, I, I have to say I enjoyed your Stars and Stripes video. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's nice. a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, me too. Way to go, Ben. <laughs> Yeah, if any of if any of our listeners missed that this this past week maybe it was about a week ago yeah, um, it's, really good. it's on it's on facebook and youtube too right yeah yeah lots of lots of timpani pedaling nice job thanks yeah i did a little presentation on melodic timpani playing shout out to diana loomer for being the, the pioneer of that um but i had heard about david herbert for his final round for the chicago audition uh played the bass line from stars and stripes forever on timpani uh, and so I actually emailed David Herbert and then five minutes later said, never mind, I'll just arrange it myself. <laughs> and so I, I made my own little arrangement. Stephen Logan also has a really good performance on YouTube. But um, yeah, I made my own little version. It was fun. Got got the foot cam for the timpani too. Yeah, that's the best part. That's cool. Uh, well, our release date for this episode is November 11th, when many of us might be at PASIC. Um, and I think, in fact, Ben and I are both performing on the 11th, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're if you're listening to this and happen to be at Pace, it, come by and, and check us out and, and say hi. Um, ben, what happened in music history on November 11th? Uh, it turns out not much. Uh, but the, <laughs> perhaps the most significant uh, is that Britney Spears uh, at, oh, I should have written down the age, 17 or 19, I can't remember, uh, won an MTV Europe Music Award for Hit Me Baby One More Time. Less significantly, in 1888, uh, Richard Strauss's Don Juan premiered in, in Weimar. Uh, the U.S. premiere came on October 30th, 1891, by the Boston Symphony Orchestra. This is one of Strauss's famous tone poems. The percussion parts include timpani, triangles, cymbals, and glockenspiel. And for those excerpt jocks out there, the, the glockenspiel part is a very common orchestra excerpt. Uh, being Strauss, it's an extremely virtuosic piece. It contains audition excerpts for many instruments, not just the glockenspiel. And the fascinating thing about this piece to me is that Strauss composed it when he was just 24 years old. Uh, so Strauss had a very young start as a composer. He was born June 11th, 1864. He was a contemporary of Mahler. Mahler was born in 1860. Uh, and it's my understanding that the two were friends and, and sort of bounced ideas off of each other. And interestingly, Mahler, uh, in terms of large scale symphonic works, Mahler only wrote symphonies and Strauss only wrote tone poems. So they didn't step on each other's uh, toes at all in that. Strauss had a very uh, early musical upbringing. His father was a prominent horn player and early musical influence. He also got in the composer's head quite a bit as a critic uh, of both his composition and his conducting. Uh, his father was a bit of an anti-Semite and one of the famous incidences that Strauss conducted. And after the performance, his father told him that, and I quote, you hurry like a Jew. Uh, so not necessarily always the most constructive criticism. Strauss lived to be 85 years old, so he has quite an extensive catalog of these massive tone poems. Some of his other famous works include Burlesque for Piano and Orchestra, uh, which has a famous timpani excerpt. It's actually a piano concerto that starts with timpani. Death and Transfiguration also sprock Zarathustra, which is a famous timpani part. It's that introduction of A Space Odyssey, if you're familiar with that film. An Alpine Symphony, which is perhaps his largest work. Salome, which has a famous xylophone excerpt in Ein Heldenleben. And one of the most interesting parts of Strauss's life to me is that he's one of those uh, complex musical figures or artistic figures even of the early 20th century in Germany. Uh, and so he did not join the Nazi party, but if you were in Germany at the time, you basically had no choice but to be assimilated into the Nazi party. And he was initially cooperative as the Nazi party, for one thing, had the goal of promoting German art and culture. 
and also he wanted to protect his Jewish daughter-in-law and grandchildren from persecution. He used his influence to prevent them from being sent to a concentration camp. And at the end of the war, he was apprehended by American soldiers. He told these soldiers, I am Richard Strauss, the composer of Rosen Cavalier and Salome. Lieutenant Milton Weiss, who was a musician, nodded in recognition and placed an off-limits sign on his lawn to protect Strauss. So that's uh, what happened today in music history. Wow, cool. You don't, you don't have anything about Britney Spears' father? Uh, I do not, but... You could, uh, we could do I, like a dad's <laughs> comparison, I think. Yeah, very... <laughs> very poor fathers of prominent musical figures, but right. <laughs> uh, all, all jokes aside, I have watched the, the you know, Britney Spears documentaries and I'm, I'm very happy to see that she's finally out of her conservatorship. That whole thing was a mess. Agreed. Sounds like it, sounds like it, yeah. Well, actually, I have one question before we move on. Was it like a formal agreement, do you think? Mahler's like, well, I'll write symphonies if you stick to symphonic poems and I don't think so. I, I can't say with any authority because I'm, I'm not an expert, but uh, we talked about them in Mr. Green's class at University of Miami. And I think instead, not so much a formal agreement so much as they just both found what interested them and it just yeah. happened to be different, maybe. Um, but I'm no, uh, I'm no expert on that, so I can't say for sure. Maybe there was a secret pact. Who knows? It's interesting. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. That was great. So without further ado, our guest today is Boyce Jeffries. Boyce is currently finishing up his DMA at the University of Toronto, where he has studied with both Ayun Huang um, and Beverly Johnston, both of whom have been on the podcast before. Um, and before Toronto, Boyce studied at the Sacramento State School of Music, and he's currently finishing up his first album that's titled Near and Dear, which we will look forward to hearing. And he's recently defended his doctoral dissertation that is titled Digitization, Dissemination, and Reception of Percussion Performance, Evaluating YouTube Videos of John Cage's Third Construction Through Analysis and Case Studies. So welcome to the show, Boyce. It's so great to have you on. Thanks, everybody. It's uh, pretty exciting to be here with all of you. So I thought we'd start off with um, just a little background on your dissertation and, and what led you to this topic. What was the impetus for this? Um, well, it was sort of twofold. Um, I sort of had a lot of difficulty with the academic side of my degree. I went to Toronto with a lot of ideas about what I could do for um, you know, dissertation research paper. And I just sort of was stuck in the mud for a long time, actually. And so the sort of first emphasis was get my coursework done, get my recitals going, and just get some sort of momentum happening. And I had sort of reached a point where I just, um, you know, swept things under a rug for a bit too long and got to this point where, okay, my recitals are done, my coursework is done, I need a topic. Um, and that came sort of in March of 2020, when, as we all know, things sort of grinded to a halt. Um, and so I was sort of forced to reckon with uh, uh, the idea that I wasn't going to be really leaving my apartment that much and that I needed to uh, get this thing off the ground and going. So just reading a lot every day, thinking, writing ideas down, coming up with proposals and sort of workshopping those and then finally, I found a viable topic um, that did even transform throughout the writing process. Um, but I don't want to say that my interest in YouTube was necessarily because of the pandemic. Um, I started high school in 2005, which I think is the year that YouTube launched publicly. Um, and so I, I think I've kind of grown up with YouTube. Um, and, but I didn't really think about how it affected my percussion studies on a more conscious level until like 2013, 2014. Um, and that was the time that I got my first smartphone. Um, I had a flip phone, all of my friends can attest to this. I was uh, very much, uh, I don't wanna say anti-technology, but uh, I'm a very distractible person. So less is more. Um, so when I finally you know, got this, this Samsung smartphone, I started to, you know, spend time that maybe I shouldn't have been spending watching YouTube. Um, but uh, I started to sort of notice like, okay, wow, this can be a great resource, but on the other hand, it can be really sort of influential in one's craft. Um, 
but you know experiences with social media and technology we don't necessarily document the process that much we sort of just live through it and then when we come out the other side we think oh what what happened here so i think for me it was sort of kind of a a, a blessing in disguise i was sort of just sitting in my apartment thinking about this and thinking about sort of the enormity of it all and you know looking up other research topics no one's really sort of addressed this before at least in music performance you know some articles here and there that i found but not sort of a big document. And I think from my experience, sort of as a, a participant in YouTube and as an observer, um, it's really had a huge impact on our community and our field of percussion. I mean, people who have sort of just become, you know, they've established their careers with YouTube being a vehicle for that, um, promoting compositions, promoting their performances. You guys had um, Evan Chapman on last week. Um, he sort of has revolutionized this idea of, of um, you know, music cinematography, right? Like, so it's just, I think it's just one of those things we've just sort of not really thought about too much. And I'm, I'm interested, you know, in just opening doors for people to keep, to keep sort of going. And I don't really have any agenda. I just sort of want to start the conversation. Well, I think you're right. I think it's something we're all like walking through this experience kind of together and in a lot of ways, not always consciously aware of how it's affecting us and our consumption of music and even us as performers. Um, so I think it's I think it's a great topic. And it's funny that you mentioned about smartphones. I think Ben and I, I think I think we got smartphones around the same time. We were both at University of Miami at the time. Yeah, like 2014 or so. Yeah. No, it was well, maybe 2000. Sorry, no, no, 2011. Like yeah, that. Got my yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it, I, like, I remember thinking like practicing feels way different now than it did before there was a computer in my pocket, you know, it's just, it's, it's funny how much it, how much it changed. And I mean, even to the point where if you were practicing a piece, um, to go and check a recording, you'd have to like walk to the library, you know, or go and, you know, you can, you can still go on YouTube, it's there. But then when, when you have a smartphone, it's like, oh, it's like, I'll just check it right now and see if I solve that. So, um, for better, or for worse, there it is. And, and Boyce, I think this was a question I was planning on asking you later, but uh, you kind of already answered it, how the pandemic maybe altered the, the direction of your research. I wasn't sure if it was a topic you came up with before the pandemic started or realizing like once everything was, you know, more or less everything is consumed online. Um, so did as the pandemic progressed, I remember at the beginning, we didn't know if it was going to be a month or, you know, a week or a month or a year. And now here we are like still in this kind of strange holding pattern with it. Um, how did the pandemic alter the direction of your research and your writing as it progressed? I don't know if it really altered things, but I sort of, I think I struck gold in the sense that it was increasingly more and more relevant as time went on. Um, you know, the one thing that sort of stands out to me is because sort of we were adapting ways of making music and creating music and sharing music with our audiences, um, I think in some ways, uh, you know, this digitization of performance, um, it really got people sort of, I think, more involved online with YouTube, um, you know, running like the U of T percussion YouTube page, you start to see subscribers, you know, counts boosting, you see more engagement. There's this idea of, you know, the, um, the concert chat room, right, where you have all these applause emojis after pieces. Um, and so I think in, in some ways we've sort of, I, I don't want to say come full circle, but we've sort of realized the um, affordances that we have because of a platform like YouTube, where you can engage with people um, all over the world. Um, so I think, you know, it's sort of, um, yeah, I don't think it really changed the sort of direction, but I think it really just sort of solidified that like, whoa, like this is, this is actually very relevant to what we're doing now and possibly what we do going forward. Um, so that's, that's super exciting um, to know that this document will live, you know, sort of beyond, uh, you know, a shelf somewhere in Toronto, so. Yeah, I was just gonna say, when I discovered YouTube, I didn't work for five days. I did absolutely nothing. I watched Cookie Monster sing Chocolate Rain about a thousand times. <laughs> uh, like that's directly that's from Michael Scott. <laughs> Michael Scott quote, if anyone's an, an Office fan. Uh, no, but I was I was gonna say, uh, I went to college in 2005, so 
uh, when when YouTube came out. Um, and I distinctly remember a couple of years in, uh, I uploaded some some videos. And if you look really, I might have actually put it as unlisted at this point. But if you look really hard, you can find like 19 year old me playing Eric Smooth's fourth rotation. Um, but then I remember, I mean, the only people we ever saw perform were those in our percussion studio, unless you went to PASIC and saw people or something like that. And the first other YouTube percussionist I ever discovered was Brian Calhoun, who was at Percussion Episode 1, uh, who does some wonderfully unique things with marimba and voice. Uh, and so it was cool. I, I met, I like Facebooked Brian and we ended up chatting at PASIC. It was cool to meet someone. And then the second YouTube person I ever discovered was Casey. And <laughs> it was at that, I think I've told this story before, but it was at that moment that I was like, Oh my God, does, does everyone that I don't know play like this? And like, am I just totally screwed? <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> and uh, then I, like, obviously over the years, I, I ended up meeting Casey and I've worked with Casey quite, quite a bit with this podcast. Um, but I do know that, that YouTube in a sense had a, a big impact on Casey's career in getting discovered somewhat as a composer. And Tom Burrett once joked that, that Casey was the Justin Bieber of the percussion world in terms of getting discovered by YouTube. So yeah. Casey, could could you yeah. tell us, like, do you feel like YouTube was a big, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, catalyst in your early career? Or was it just sort of like a thing you did and your career was separate from that? I think Tom put it the best. Like, I don't think I can really put it a better way than the Bieber thing, because you know everyone who knows justin bieber knows me too like we're kind of like at the yeah. same level of friends. fame the same level of like we make the same amount of money i drive the same kind of cars stuff like that so tom tom nailed it with with that one but yeah yeah of course it was like super super important and something i, I i'd love to hear boyce you know elaborate like i mean i i imagine what youtube did is it kind of did the same thing that technology does for like home recording you know it's like all of a sudden you can make a very home produced decent album and put it on Bandcamp or spotify or whatever like all of a sudden the gatekeepers aren't who they used to be and now you can access an audience that just wasn't at your fingertips before and now and now it is yeah i mean the the, the power of the internet is is instantaneous um and you know i've Casey was someone I referred to in the dissertation. Another um, couple that come to mind, Ivan Trevino, um, uh, Gene Koshinsky. I mean, uh, you know, people that have sort of, I think, sidestepped that more traditional way of finding a publisher and having them sort of do the, the, the PR for them, right? You really become sort of the own agent for, your, um, for the dissemination of your art. If you're a performer, if you're a composer, um, and I think that that has been hugely advantageous for a lot of people. Um, but then, you know, I talk in my dissertation a bit about the, the sort of dangers of, of crowdsourcing and the way that, that YouTube sort of, you know, it's open for everyone, but they do have incentives of how they control content and how we interact with content informs their algorithms. And we're sort of, I think, in some ways, we have to recognize that there is a feedback loop that can occur where you know, certain certain recordings of performance are, are sort of watched more than others. And as time goes on, the, the sort of gap between those becomes wider. So I think, you know, you had said it earlier, Carly, you were talking about the consumption of music. Um, and I think for me, as much as we consume digital media, I think it would be great to sort of contextualize it to get future, current and future generations of students to digest it. Um, so to me, that's sort of the big thing. I saw myself consuming a lot of YouTube, but even doing this research, I sort of wanted to think more about digesting what it is I'm watching instead of just sort of taking it. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's one chapter in your dissertation that's titled Here, Now, and What Lies Ahead. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more. What are, what are some of the implications of this YouTube culture? Um, and I guess, what do you see as some effects moving forward, both positive and negative? There are huge advantages to having access to so much, but um, what, what do you see there? Um, there's a lot. I mean, you know, I, I'm very much uh, thinking so much about the big picture, so much so that sometimes it's overwhelming. 
um, in my in my dissertation defense, one of my advisors asked me, you know, what does this mean for art? And I sort of got emotionally overwhelmed because you think about, you know, it's sort of a, I don't want to say it's a political buzzword, but you hear, you know, like big tech, right? Like the, the, the phantom in the sky that controls everything. And in some ways um, that is a bit alarming, maybe not so much with, you know, performance videos of percussion repertoire, um, but just this idea that, um, you know, concerns about security and, and data privacy and, you know, the rights and, and freedoms that, you know, you should sort of have, have on the internet. Um, so I, you know, I try not to think about that too much, but in terms of what it means for performance, I think um, we sort of have to contextualize what it is that we're watching. Um, from the case study I conducted on, on a number of undergrad percussionists, you know, they expressed a lot of concerns about, you know, watching these note perfect, uh, pristine recordings um, that they're very inspired by, but they also sort of can set unhealthy expectations upon themselves and their own performance. Um, I think one participant was saying that, you know, getting accustomed to hearing sort of these inorganic sounds of, of percussion instruments, it sort of gives them a, a sort of romanticized version of, of what it is that they'll actually encounter in their own experience. Um, so I'm not, not, you know, of the mindset that we should push YouTube away, but I, I think that we need to sort of look at it with a bit more of a critical scope um, in terms of what we're watching and, and what we're looking for, because, um, you know, if performers are only referencing, you know, one or two performance videos, and if they do that before they're looking at the score, then that can have a big, big influence on their own interpretation. Um, I mean, if, it, if, if I had the option to, I would, I would turn this sort of document and, and make it like a, a seminar where you can get undergrad students to really think about um, what it is that they're doing online and how, how it pertains to their art or how it doesn't pertain to their art. Um, so I think now is a good time more than ever to do that sort of self-reflection. But I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's tons of performances just waiting to be discovered. You know, we don't have to just listen to one or two recordings. We can sort of look through um, and find more, you know, performances and sort of unpack those things. So there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, going forward. And I hope that this sort of, you know, keeps catalyzing things in that direction. I'm glad that you mentioned about, you know, kind of the, I guess, mental health of, of students as they check recordings and understanding. One of my biggest concerns is that we watch so many videos that are edited. They're not, it's not a single run through as it would be in a live performance. And so I think for, for everybody, but especially for younger students, like they might think, wow, you know, everybody has no perfect performances except for me or except for me and my studio because you hear other people's live performances and just kind of having this unrealistic expectation there. Isn't it, isn't it kind of like, yeah, everyone, everyone on Instagram has perfect abs too. Like, right. It's pretty, pretty easy to like knock down. Right. And I, I was just going to say real quick, like one of my students, his name's Tyler Endy. He's, he's really excellent percussionist. He's going to yeah, be someone uh, we hear about someday, I'm sure. But um, he, he, he comes into his lessons and I say that typical thing like, well, who have you listened to? What have you listened to? And he says, I'm trying not to yet. Like he tries to go about a month before kind of letting, like opening the door to all of that. And when he does, he tries not to like open, like I'm going to listen to like everything on YouTube. It's like, well, no, like, yeah, as soon as you, according to him, like as soon as you start listening, that's when you you um you stop like extracting it yourself and i've just i've come to like really appreciate and respect that so I, it seems like an easy thing to like if it bothers you like you could easily avoid it if you wanted to but maybe maybe that's not what voices has, has found yeah ben you're not on instagram so yeah you wouldn't have perfect abs that's exactly right <laughs> yeah but i mean this is like this is like raw all over social media right it's like yeah. a huge problem and they talk about the the you know suicidal ideations like hyper increased in like teenage girls especially 
Um, it's just like, it's really, yeah, like a big problem because you see like, oh, look how perfect everyone's like lives are and how gorgeous everyone is. And um, yeah, I mean, it would only make sense that, um, yeah, you, you only put up recordings that you, uh, yeah, like nailed or, uh, or whatever. One, one thing that I found really interesting, Boyce, in your paper was you talked about, uh, basically there was a study done where professional and amateur performers were like they swapped the audio so you were looking at like an amateur performer with like a you know with a good video uh, like a, a well-produced video listening to a professional performer or vice versa and did i say that right basically or like basically people whatever had the better video quality is what they listened to or is what their like preference was does that make sense so like an, um, an amateur with better, wait, wait, what am I, voice? can you clarify what I'm trying to say here? <laughs> I'm not saying this very well. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think the, the way I described it in the paper is they're interchanging audio and video between an amateur and a professional performer. And I use the term sort of congruently and incongruently in the sense that you, you know, have the same pairings together and then you sort of reverse that. And a number of yeah, studies. Yeah, I think I kept saying the wrong thing. That, yeah, under certain circumstances, um, you know, most basically the visual medium became very dominant. Um, and this, you know, there's been all sorts of different studies about how the visual reception of things can sort of mess with our our mind. Um, there's really um, interesting guy named Michael Schutz who's in uh, Ontario, Canada, and he talks a lot about gesture and sound perception. And I think he had, I think it was Michael Burrett doing these experiments of playing a marimba bar and leaving his hand down and then doing like a legato upstroke and thinking, yeah. you know, was we that talked a about that on the was podcast a long... like a long time ago, we talked about oh. that. I can't remember which episode well, it was. Well, but yeah. we've, had, we've had Michael Schultz on. Yeah, well, that's what it was, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's even studies too about like, even something as shallow as like a tire you know, there were these sort of um, control groups of musicians and non-musicians who watched, I think it was, I think they were violinists. And um, basically one came out in very formal attire and the other came out in like jeans and a t-shirt. And the uh, case study participants thought that the person who was best dressed was more technically proficient than the person just wearing jeans. Um, so something as shallow as, as appearance and um, this idea of like, persona or presentation, I think has a huge impact on, on what people sort of think is authoritative. You know, we used to think about authority being like, you know, teachers and traditions and the sort of like, you know, um, that sort of reverence you have for certain, you know, icons in the field. Um, but now, you know, authority on YouTube is sort of convoluted because um, it's, it's metrics, right? It's crowdsourced, you know, a million people have watched this video and this video has been liked, you know, a hundred thousand times. So this must be the best, right? This must be what's valuable in, in terms of like, I think I described it as like a sort of socio-cultural currency. Um, it's not, you know, it's not like Bitcoin, we can't spend it, but we have, it gives us power, right? It gives us that YouTube capital. So um, yeah. And I think, I guess going back to sort of mental health thing is, is I just know that the pandemic has really affected, you know, um, this idea of, of performing and, you know, what is performance? If we're able to stitch together our sort of, you know, best of moments, um, you know, audiences can perceive of it as a continuous sort of unfolding event. Um, but we know, right, we've all done it. I mean, I'm putting together an album and there were so many times where I'm playing through something and I'm like, no, it wasn't perfect. Got to do it again because it's that, that expectation, right? That as soon as it's out there, it's preserved and people will, you know, evaluate it based on what they're accustomed to, which is, you know, perfection. I mean, for lack of a better word. But. I think one thing you're, you're sort of touching on a lot that I find interesting is it's, it's not even exclusive to recording. It's just like the, that the presentation of music matters. And I think that Evelyn Glennie has been a master of this in her career of, things like lighting on a performance stage. Uh, you should have unique lighting for each piece. You should use colors. You should use bright spotlights for certain pieces and dim stage lighting for others. 
And it reminds me, have you guys heard the uh, the story about Joshua Bell going to the subway station and busking? I just, I, I looked. Yeah, I looked it up and it's, it's a true story. It's not like a, a legend. In 2007, he went to the subway station, it looks like in, in Washington, D.C., uh, and played like a recital that he had played the night before. Uh, and Leonard Slatkin, the famous conductor, predicted that out of a thousand people, my guess is there might be 35 or 40 who will recognize the quality for what it is. Maybe 75 to 100 will stop and spend some time listening. He also predicted that Joshua Bell would make $150. Uh, and out of 1,097 people that passed when Joshua Bell was busking, only 27 gave any money. Only seven actually stopped and listened for any length of time. And total, he made $52.17. <laughs> and so, I mean, like, it Is really that... does go to, to show that, yeah, I mean, there is a difference between paying for a ticket to an exclusive concert hall and seeing someone standing on stage and seeing the same person standing outside in jeans and a baseball cap playing the exact same music in the exact same way, it, it feels different. Um, and I think one thing that's so powerful about video as a medium, and when we talk about like 410 Media, what they do so well, is that you can sort of highlight things in a presentation and like 410 Media, they have some videos, there's like, it's a very frenetic kind of a lot of cuts between different videos and there's so much focus on the performer's hands. Whereas normally when we watch a performer, we see the face like the shoulders the head the, the, like everything above and so that can give a really uh interesting quality to the music well, well i'm going to ask you then like the leonard slacken thing it, it, that's probably not about the setting of like the concert hall versus the subway that's just like it's a totally different audience it probably says something more about like the reception of classical music just out in the world right it's like of course of course like yeah like how many people didn't go i bet there's like exactly yeah. proportionate to like the amount of people that didn't buy a ticket also were passing by saying yeah. like, i don't i don't i don't care about any violin no matter how good it is True. yeah you know? I th real quick i think one thing i was gonna i was about to say with like the youtube thing is like one thing that's interesting about video and like highlighting different parts of performance is like the video that carly mentioned that i just put out when you watch a timpanist you can't see their feet their feet are completely covered up and obscured by the drums and on the video that I just put out, uh, I, I was actually mad because I set up the camera off centered. And then I realized that because I did, I had the perfect little window in the corner to put a, a foot cam. So I think that did pay off in the end. Um, but yeah, you can, like I said, you can highlight different things and you can direct the listener's ear in a different way. Just like if you were playing a calm meditative piece, dimming the lights would have that same effect on a stage. And like uh, Ji Hye Jung's performance of Christopher Dean's Morning Dove Sonnet, which is amazing, uh, falls into that category for me. It's not bright stage lighting. It's very dim, and I think it sets the mood quite a bit. Yeah, you can be a director, you know. Yeah, you can you can focus and say, oh, now listen to this. Okay, now put your ear towards that. It's just it's like similar, like, yeah, give your students an audio recording and a score, you know, like a score in their hand, and they can follow. They, they notice so much more, you know, because they can read music and you know, they notice all these details that if you were just watching or excuse me, just listening, or even if you were uh, uh, listening and watching video performance, like you just like notice more in the score. Well, I guess that the thing we're kind of dancing around is like, we, of course, we experience music and really all arts with all of our senses. I mean, YouTube, of course, is sight and sound and whatever senses we happen to be experiencing wherever we are. But if we're in a concert live, like there's, you know, we're, we're just immersed in it. Um, Boyce, I wonder, one, one source that you reference in your paper that I thought sounded really interesting is titled Music Education in a Post-Performance World, and it's from the Oxford Handbook of Music Education, written by Matthew Tibault. Um, and I thought it was interesting, this was written in 2012, so even back in 2012, there's somebody writing academic, you know, scholarly, scholarly research on a post-performance world. Um, I wonder what, like, what do you think we've arrived at this? He, so he talks about post-performance world as um, a place where most experiences with music are through a digital medium rather than live performance. Many pieces of music are produced in a studio that separates musicians from the audience and recordings have radically changed the way that we listen to and hear music. Yeah, I mean, it's, I would say on one hand, it's sort of surreal, but you know, the, I guess the, the sort of power of language is that 
we always we always tend to think in things of you know what's what sort of come before and there's a lot of post this you know post humanism post you know I, th it's just so it's just interesting to just think about sort of the idea of it being behind because obviously performance is not you know it's not that we don't have performance at this moment it's that the spaces in, in which we can perform are digital and they're compressed um i would say you know i mean i think in some ways the experience online is becoming i guess further mediated is how i would describe it in the sense that the most sort of organic way to you know experience performance as both a player and as a listener is in the concert hall but then again, in the concert hall, your, you know, your visual perception and your audio perception doesn't really change. You're in the same seat. Um, you're sort of just observing things. It's, I don't want to say it's static, but it's static in terms of um, what you're able to see and listen to. Um, but like Ben, you were talking about, you know, close shots of hands and things like that. You know, recording technology, both audio and visual, it allows us to sort of intake this sort of new set of intimacies, you know, the idea of seeing something and hearing something that you wouldn't hear in a concert hall or you wouldn't see the very minute details. And there's beauty in that. Um, but I think the more we sort of come to expect those things, um, the more we are, I don't want to say disappointed, but we're not exactly getting the experience that we're accustomed to. Um, so I guess for me, the sort of uh, you know, the close thing is, is that sort of, you know, being in a place in a space, it's like playing the music of, of John Luther Adams is great because it's, you know, everyone's in this environment, right? And that environment exists then and there. Um, but we start to have things more mediated. Um, you know, there's a mediation between percussion instruments and microphones, right? And there's a mediation between you know, the, the sound that we captured and how we curate it and how we edit, it. you know, simple things like reverb, you know, to simulate the concert experience, but it's, it's not really there. It's this sort of um, mediation between man and machine. And now I think we're in the stage of it being further mediated where, you know, we have audience engagement like concert chats and we have things that we can show audience perception of, you know, what, what they um, enjoy viewing and what they would like to applaud sort of in the digital arena. Um, but that process in itself is mediated by YouTube. Um, so I think we've just reached this point where there's, I don't know, I don't want to say that, it, that, it, that it's completely post-performance. I mean, if you went by the definition, then yes, that would be the case. But I just think sort of we've reached the, you know, we've reached the very edge of it. We're sort of at this very you know, um, I don't want to say a crossroad because it's not a binary decision, but um, just there's a lot of, I think, tension right now around this idea of, you know, there's people that write about, you know, what is real, right? What does the real world mean? And what does virtual mean? And what is virtual reality? Like, you know, so I think it's just, it's an interesting time to think about, but I just think contextualizing it is the most important thing. So if you have students that are watching these things, ask them, you know, this is edited, right? Like, you know, this is a very polished, curated, it's an artifact, right? It's meant for preservation. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm all about context. I think that really plays a, a big role in all of this. So, yeah. Boys, I have a, a question in that regard. We we're talking so much about this, I guess you could call it search for perfectionism and recording. And it, always sounds like a negative thing like oh we're, we're not after the artistry anymore we're after the the reproduction of this perfectly accurate recording and whenever we have that discussion to me glenn gould comes to mind because glenn gould at a certain point in his career stopped performing because he said that it felt like a live performance was just like this show to go you know watch a monkey on stage and, and try and catch the monkey making a mistake and he enjoyed recording and editing. And I don't think that we think of Glenn Gould as someone like, oh, well, yeah, but he couldn't really play the piano well. So he stitched together recordings. I mean, that's obviously not the case at all. And I'm, I think many of his things were probably one take. Uh, so do you find the, uh, do you find this to be a negative or a positive or it can be both? Uh, does perf live performance inform recording and vice versa? Like what's your take on all of that? Well, I think you know, I don't, I don't want to say it's a bad thing because it is nice to listen to something that's really, you know, like just, you know, 
I don't want to say perfect in the real sense of the word, but it's nice to have that, you know, for referential purposes. But obviously the one thing that recording technology affords us is the ability to listen to others and listen back to ourselves. You know, when we can't really analyze live performance because, you know, it, it it's moving through time, right? But um, recordings, you can always go back and listen to. I think for, for me personally, when I was applying to a number of doctoral programs, I just did excerpts from live performances. I didn't, you know, there were a couple like little etudes they had to record, but um, for me, I just wanted to be transparent in the sense that like what you see is what you get. I'm, I'm not trying to put together a package. I'm just showing you this is who I am and this is what I can do. Um, so I think, you know, these, I think, per, you know, the, the perfect recordings, it can be inspirational. And I do get inspired by those things. But I know that um, I've sort of come to terms with the fact that I know it's not going to be that way for me. And I think we just need to encourage people that um, that that's the case. Um, so, I mean, even the, even the, 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 the best of the best are, are human beings. And that's what makes you know, that's what makes live performance more special than any, any online concert or any thing you can watch is just seeing human bodies, right, engaging in expression. Um, so I think, you know, as we start to move beyond the current situation, I, I am hopeful that people will be more appreciative of live performance. Um, because I think Casey said earlier, this idea of being able to access so many different things if it's more accessible, it has the chance to, to lose value. And maybe sometimes we take those things for, for granted. So certainly I, I hope that, you know, people will go to more concerts and they'll really just, you know, just enjoy the experience. Cause that's what it is, right? Like performing is an experience. Listening to a concert is an experience and you can't, you can't replicate that online. And there are things that you can't take online and replicate in the hall, right? Like you're not going to have that perfect balance of percussion and tape, you know, because it's not, it's not going to be, be balanced, right? So I don't know, that's just a long winded way of saying, yeah, perfection is nice, but it's, it's not the ultimate goal for me. How many, you know, you mentioned, um, it's important to explain to students or young people that, hey, this is edited. Um, how many are edited? Because I, I kind of feel like, wait, I've seen like, a lot of recordings that are definitely wrought with mistakes and not edited <laughs> like wait how many like do, did you we, we were able to figure out like yeah like I, how many are like per, note perfect I mean I, I feel like I see ones that are far from note perfect far more often than a really nice you know 410 media production yeah well I think it it just depends on the repertoire so you know my I did this sort of corpus study on YouTube videos, third construction, and you know, 90% of them were live performances that were captured. Um, there were only a few, you know, sort of studio recordings um, that that were, you know, discernible, right? You could sort of see, like, okay, this camera wasn't there 30 seconds before, so obviously they've, you know, put multiple takes together. Um, but I think it just depends on the piece. I mean, right now, you know, maybe we're sort of in this YouTube overload in the sense that maybe people don't feel like posting anything because they know that it's maybe not gonna get, you know, what they're hoping, right? That it's not gonna get a high number of views. So maybe, you know, maybe people aren't posting as many, you know, video recordings of themselves performing. Um, and so maybe they just see that one sort of polished thing as a, as a tool for reference. Um, and then they just don't feel the need to post it themselves. So I think it depends on the repertoire. I mean, if you type in yellow after the rain, there's gonna be, you know, YouTube doesn't give you uh, numbers of results, right? You just keep scrolling. It's like, it's like the price is right, you know, spin that wheel, like, and it goes for like a minute and a half, right? So um, who knows? I mean, it would be interesting to see over time, like, are people posting more, you know, canonized repertoire or do they feel like, well, there's enough recordings of that, so why bother, right? So I think it, it just depends on, on, uh, on what you encounter. So it, it's a case by case basis. I mean, maybe someone will read this document that I put together and go, oh, I can do a corpus study on YouTube videos. Like that's cool. Um, so I think it, it just depends, but 
YouTube only gives you, you know, the foam of the latte, right? They're just going to give you like the very top based on numbers and, and audience engagement, right? So for me, like digging down more into it um, is definitely rewarding in, in that right. So yeah, I spent a lot of time on YouTube, probably too much. But. So, so is it really having the like perfect abs effect that Instagram is having? Like, do we know that? Like, are, no, people I, getting, just, are people feeling like, is there like a mass, you know, negative impact on musicians who are saying like, oh, I could never, I can never play like that? I don't know. I mean, I would say, I would say certainly that the, the, the sort of levels of performance have been increasing. There are a number of, you know, phenomenal young players that are, are rising stars, right? And you've interviewed a number of them. I would say that we don't really know because we haven't really conducted the research about it. I mean, the only thing that I sort of drew from, from the case study that I did on these undergrads is that if they just watch the videos, they're very influenced by visual things, um, by, you know, this sort of stimulation, right? Being able to see things that are changing and moving. Um, they also don't really like recordings that are old in terms of like chronological age. Like one of the video excerpts that they watched the third construction was uh, Amadinda's recording. And that was shot in 1992, right? Which is, by so, the way, incredible. So <laughs> it's good. the best recording. Oh, that's the best one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. By far. Yeah. yeah, you damn kids, that's the best one. <laughs> but then, you know, they, they watched, like there was a, there's another video of Nexus from 1984 in, in Korea. And they play the tempo extremely slow at the beginning. I mean, if you, you know, consider it objectively like 108 to the half note, I think I clocked them at like 84 beats per minute at the beginning. So, um, you know, and they, they, they didn't really sort of think about that. They were just watching, you know, the camera's changing almost every four seconds, right? Um, but then when you take that away um, by including the score, then minds were changed. So I think for me, sort of not removing the visual, but just recognizing its, its uh, power of influence. Um, and then the other thing too, I think that a lot of sort of the case study participants said is that just being prompted to view these things and answer questions about them, they found to be really interesting. You know, they thought, um, you know, initially they were just watching and sort of like just consuming the stuff. And then when they were sort of prompted, like, you know, what, what do you think about the, the drum choices of these performers? What do you think about, um, you know, the accuracy of their interpretation? Then it sort of starts, I think, to get the wheels sort of churning in a different way. So I, you know, I'm, I'm all for conducting more research on this type of thing. Like Ben, you talked about the, we talked about this earlier, but the, the sort of interchanging of visual and, and audio elements between professionals and amateurs. Like, I think it would be really interesting to see a video, you know, a very professionally done performance by a very renowned performer, but have it just be like ratioed with thousands of like negative comments and like thumbs down. And like, if someone else were to watch that, would they be influenced by that sort of public reception? Like if there's a video of Casey playing his own piece and there's tons of people going, oh, this sucks, you know, like what you know what's that power of influence like yeah how so i think i'll send you oh, yeah i'll send you a link i got it i got I it say, how, <laughs> how have we gone through almost an hour and haven't talked about youtube comments yet? <laughs> <laughs> that's the next episode <laughs> you know youtube comments i think it's it's a great place because it provides you know that audience reception and that sort of commentary there was this um this dance scholar she she did a dissertation about the circulation of, of popular dance on YouTube and she calls the comment section she calls it like a paratext where it basically becomes part of the video and that people can sort of look and they can sort of intake what other people are thinking about it and I you know I love comment sections YouTube comment sections are just funny it's off the wall it's you know like there was uh there's one video about a, a, a wedding proposal where this guy was like flying an airplane and he's proposing to his girlfriend. And uh, the first comment that has like thousands of likes is like, well, if she says no, he'll just take the plane down and crash. And it's like, okay, that's dark, but it's funny. Like, so um, yeah, I just, 
I don't know. YouTube is just fascinating. I, I love it. I mean, I know I waste too much time on it, but it's just, it's never stale. It's all, there's always something, right? It's, what was, there's some stat I read, like in 2019, this one guy estimated that 500 hours of content is uploaded to YouTube every minute. Like, it's just like, it's the world's largest video archive. Um, so it's just, there's, there's, there's like, it's endless. It's, it's endless. And it's, you know, I like that, but I also don't like it because I'm not very, you know, like focused sometimes. So it's staggering. Gosh, I remember, um, you know, you said YouTube was started in 2005. I remember sitting in my freshman dorm room, um, like, what is this thing? Like, I don't, I don't know about this. And it's just, it's amazing to see what it it's become from there. Um, boys, I did want to mention there's a there's a study we talked about on the show a little while ago um, from the Bulletproof Musician podcast talking about kind of just that interchanging audio and video from different different performers. And I think it is it was actually one audio sample by a professional pianist. I can't remember who off the top of my head. And there were three um, three different videos that were overlaid and one had the pianist moving a whole lot like really expressively with you know body and head and and everything and then one where they moved a little bit and one where they moved um not at all like it was just really stiff and everybody in the in the study rated the person who moved the most as the most musical and expressive and i think even accurate i, I can't remember but it was a whole set of value judgment based on just the visual element so it's, it's interesting. I, I have to ask you, Boyce, because we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, about, about checking videos before we even start working on a piece um, for students and I'm sure for professionals too. In your personal performance, do you usually listen to or watch a recording before you begin learning a piece if there's one available? Um, it sort of fluctuates. There was a time in which I was trying to avoid it. And I think that was just sort of my... Uh, response to realizing like oh this could really have an influence on me um but in some ways you know that was sort of how I kept my uh my chops going so during the summer for about 10 years I worked on a commercial fishing boat in Alaska and you know it's a long time off to not practice and so you know recordings and video recordings help me sort of you know uh sort of stay like stay active in terms of observing performance and taking it in so there were some years I think it was sort of more in my undergrad where I would you know just every time I would was back in town off the boat I'd go to the library and sort of watch and listen to recordings of like the recital rep that I wanted to program um so in some ways you know it, it's definitely a great resource as far as now I try I try not to listen right away. It's tempting to sort of have that, you know, at the tip of your fingers, just punch this recording in and follow along with the score. Um, but I think I'm, I'm trying to sort of pick and choose when I do that. Some of that is, is circumstance, not being able to be behind a certain instrument. It's very helpful to get that sort of visual, you know, um, thing or things like, you know, figuring out how to do a multi setup that doesn't have a diagram from the composer that can that can be super helpful to getting started. So um, I try I try not to do it as often. And I think part of that is I'm just sort of recognizing how, you know, how big YouTube has become and how I kind of want to uh, just sort of be my be my own self. And that just sort of comes with uh, what was it at this quote by Robert Frost? This is the only freedom is in departure. So just sort of putting that sort of aside and just, you know, kind of going your own way. Um, but YouTube's not going anywhere. So if I need it, I'll pop it on. If I don't, that's okay. So um, it's it's certainly gotten less as I've, I've, as I've gotten older. It's not as much as it used to be, so. Sure. Yeah. Well, every once in a while, I mean, I, I do this, if there's like a, a, a setup question, like how did somebody else figure this out? And it's not necessarily that what they do is the best way or the only way or anything, but like, Hey, here's a possible solution or sticking. Sometimes I'm like, I'll find a spot and just check a couple different people. What did they do here and see like, Oh, I like that. Or, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's really hard to say like, Oh, this is always a bad thing, but 
of course, we want to develop our own versions of the piece. We don't want to just replicate somebody else's. What a little a little off topic, a little little different topic. Boyce, you mentioned um, to me earlier that you have an article that's slated to be published in an upcoming Percussive Notes issue on Christopher Dean's piece, Morning Dove Sonnet. And I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about your experience with the piece. Yeah, so um, let's see. This, this sort of came about, I think the idea of it was my experiences with revisiting the work. So I had learned it, I think, for some, some master's auditions years ago. And then I thought, oh, well, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to play it again, you know, for a couple performances or, or maybe just to sort of have in my bank of repertoire. And as I've sort of gone through the doctoral program, I've really realized the value of having that, you know, a collection of pieces in your back pocket that you could sort of, you know, dust off within short notice. Um, and so, you know, the, sort of revisiting Morning Dove Sonnet, the main idea was how can I be more effective and more efficient in my performance? And some of those things, you know, led me to watch other recordings on YouTube. Um, there was one sort of, there's the if you follow the bowing instructions in the piece, um, you know, sometimes bowing the natural side of the vibraphone, you sort of contort your wrist a little bit, depending on where your body is positioned. And uh, I saw this performer where he would sort of maintain that up bow instruction that's written in the piece, um, but they would squat down and use their legs to sort of, you know, um, be able to facilitate that bowing without sort of any discomfort in the hand. Um, and so seeing that kind of inspired me, I was like, well, what else can I do in the piece that maybe doesn't necessarily have to follow the instructions there, but it's more of uh, what's more efficient or more proficient in terms of facility. So just little things like, um, you know, when to remove the mute that's on the lower, you know, four bars of the vibraphone, um, or when you don't need to be holding the bows anymore, instead of maybe waiting until the fermata, you could maybe drop one in a certain piece. So I sort of in the article go through the spots of where you can do these things that if you were, you know, only, uh, you know, obeying the score, that that's how you would do it. Or if you only watch a certain number of interpretations on YouTube, um, people more or less do it the same way. So in some ways, I've, I've sort of looked at other performances as a way to um, kind of like a, I don't want to say a litmus test, but just in terms of figuring out well, what, you know, what can I do that's slightly different? And this is not even like talking about the, the playing. It's just more about the, the, uh, the sort of stage directions. There was this really, this really interesting book I really enjoyed reading. It's called Beyond the Score by Nicholas Cook. And he sort of talked about musical scores being like theatrical scripts um, in the sense that we, you know, read a text and then, but the way we deliver our lines um, can be different, right? And personalized. But I think for percussionists, um, we're sort of like stage actors in the sense that we have, you know, directions, right? In parentheses or asterisks. And sometimes those directions like stick changes or page turns, they aren't written in the score. Um, so I think just maybe you know, just sort of giving more context to that and thinking about well, what, you know, what can I do? How can I get rid of, of this sooner? And if I drop these bows, is this going to make this passage, you know, much easier to play? Um, so I think it's just sort of, yeah, just not, I, I don't want to say, because I just quoted beyond the score, but I don't want to say looking beyond the score, because that's just lame. Um, but just sort of digging more into it and, and thinking about, you know, your own sort of thoughts. I think we're so used to looking to others for ways to do things. I think we forget to consult a very important person along the way, and that's ourselves. Um, so I've certainly, as I've revisited repertoire, I've, I've started to think more about what I think about it rather than what I think other people have thought about it, if that makes sense. So. I was just going to mention really quickly, I noticed that Boyce has a, a YouTube video that I'm sure was related to this about, about Morning Dove Sonnet and some tips. And I mentioned earlier, Ji Hei Jung has an outstanding recording of it. Uh, two other things. One, Joshua Smith, who was a DMA from UNT, wrote his dissertation on the Dean vibraphone pieces and has some lovely uh, insight in there. And then also, uh, I noticed a few months ago that Christopher Dean actually recorded Morning Dove Sonnet. Mark Ford posted some some photos, and that recording has not been released, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, someday soon, hopefully that will be released. Wow, cool. 
I didn't realize that. I, I feel like the entire percussion community right now is still just um, mourning Christopher Dean. He had such an impact on so many people. So we have two social media questions um, for you today, Boyce. Um, first, we'll, we'll do the one from our buddy, Jade Hales. And Jade asks, what are the trends on YouTube that percussionists should invest time in? Mm, I know Jade, so hi, Jade. Um, <laughs> let's see, trends that we should invest in. Well, it depends. I mean, if you're, if you're there, um, to provide like content. I mean, I don't want to say that in a cheap way. Don't, don't be a content creator, right? Just post your stuff. So if you want to post videos of, of performance, um, I think one thing to invest in is certainly um, putting stuff out there by up and coming people, uh, composers. Um, you know, if we really want to help composers sort of get their music out there, YouTube is a great vehicle for that. Um, I don't think it matters, you know, how many subscribers you have. I think if you put it out there, um, it's, you know, the value can only go up, right? You, you can only get more views on YouTube. Um, as far as trends to sort of maybe look for um, going forward as, as, a, as using YouTube as a resource, I think um, the first thing is using the search filters. Um, there's, not, um, there's not many of them. There's only four, I think. Um, but don't be afraid to dig deeper than just the first results that YouTube spits at you. If you sort by the number of views, you're going to get the stuff that a lot of people have seen. Um, but if you sort by the upload date, you're going to get things in reverse chronological order. Um, so yeah, I would say use the filters and I would say find, find performers that you don't know and that don't live where you live. Um, so I've really enjoyed watching performers from other parts of the globe um, interpret repertoire um, because, you know, I, I grew up on the, on the West Coast and I went to school in Canada. So I, I've seen a lot of people in North America and I'd like to sort of use the advantages that YouTube has, right? To be gl almost global, it's almost everywhere. So yeah, I would say dig, dig deeper on YouTube and it's, you never know what you'll find, so. This sounds so simple, but I have to confess, I've never used the filters on YouTube. The search for like, <laughs> I don't know, well, I guess I'm, I'm it's, just. It's tough. I think in some ways, because it's, you know, it's not a, a formal research archive that, that a lot of students are used to, right? You're used to going into things and typing in specific authors or specific, specific titles. And YouTube only does these filters after you've entered a search. So it's, it's very much like, it's a, it's a, I think something that has to, you have to be conscious of doing it in order to, to make it happen, so. Well, it seems like usually we go to YouTube when we're not sure what we're looking for. It's like, I need some recording of this thing. I'll take any, because I currently I know of none. So yeah, of course, if you're using it in that way, which probably a lot of people do use it for, then yeah, it would make sense. You're just like, hey, I'm happy for just whatever you'll give me. But yeah, if you need a Nexus recording, uh, yeah, maybe you want it, or you want that on the Dinda recording we mentioned of uh, third construction. Yeah, you, you would you would already know to like consider the filters or at least put in on the Dinda third construction and you'll get it with filter or not, you know? So it just seems like you gotta, you gotta yeah, know what, know what you're, why you're searching for what you're searching for. On that note, my least favorite thing in the world is when a student's studying an excerpt and I'm like, oh, what recording did you listen to? Like, oh, some guy playing it on YouTube. Like, <laughs> okay, you saw like some guy in an orchestra or like some guy in a practice room? Like, yeah, no, just some guy in a practice. Like, well, what? <laughs> you're going to trust that for an orchestral excerpt? Like there's Ch Chicago Symphony recordings out there and like, you're like trusting, you know, Casey in a practice room playing exotic yeah, birds? Like, <laughs> Yeah. so bad not not casey that's a not you know a joke knock on casey but yeah that's for, good that's fine excerpts, I'll take man, it. like go get an orchestra recording jeez well there there are lots of good recordings though of people you know playing yeah it. well and like if you know like okay this is rob knopper playing yeah Arizona, like, uh, yeah fine okay but like there's also i mean like shoot there's recordings of me playing porgy and bess out there like don't use that <laughs> 
Well, but that that's a good point because I'll ask students like beyond did you listen to a recording? What recording? And then if if you know if they don't know, and I'll say like even if they know the name, I'll be like, so who is that? What are they like? You have to know the background. You have to know you know. It seems like it. It's just bringing us back to the same problem. Like, who is the gatekeeper and the arbiter of what's good and what's valid? It's like so. Now it's YouTube views supposedly, which I mean, like I don't. I think people know, like, oh, this is widely viewed, but it doesn't mean it's like good or or necessarily like. I think I think generally students and 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 teachers are smart enough to parse through those things. It's not that complicated, but like, yeah, it's like, yeah, talking about, you know, the first analogy I did of like, hey, it's not hard to like buy some, a cheap interface and some mics and put your album up on Spotify if you want to. It's like long gone are the days of like a guy in a fur coat and a cigar pulls up in a limo and is like, hey kid, I like you, I like your stuff, kid. Come on, come down to the studio. I'll set you that up. That sounds like locked the negotiating table, yeah. <laughs> right, like, like that's just, that's been over for a long time. And it's like, wait, that guy never knew what was good either. Like, like that. I, so I don't know. I don't think YouTube is like it may have replaced that guy, but it didn't. It didn't like the the um, the arbiter of what is good is not like a stupider guy, you know. Like that dude, that that guy was never any good either, you know. So it's just kind of it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's kind of changing changing the landscape and changing who and what the gatekeepers are. I suppose there are still gatekeepers. Yeah, yeah, but I think we never really knew who they were, I and mean, we still don't. And it's just interesting. It's like, well, if publishers were the gatekeepers, if they were the ones deciding what was good, like how come I just answered a, a Jason Baker PAS article survey about self-publishing and said, yeah, like I submitted my works to publishers when I was younger and they all rejected me and I've submitted them. And, and, and since then they've reached out and said like, hey, we'd be happy to publish you. It's like, well, okay, so they don't know what's good because they didn't think it was any good before, but now that it sells, they think it's good. No, they just want it sells. So it, it's, it, I don't know, it's, 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 it's I, I don't know if YouTube even changes that like at all. I was gonna say, you know, from conducting the case study, you know, the perceptions of each participant was very unique. Um, and they all value different things. Some of them value really high audio quality because that's what you know they need. Some of them really value visual quality in terms of you know like pixels, right? They're, they they want to watch something that's you know 4K versus you know the first YouTube videos of like 360 pixels. So um, you know, with that being said, YouTube's bottom line is sort of similar in a sense, or not similar from the participants, but similar to you know, this idea of what sells, right? Like if YouTube gets viewer stimulation, that means ad revenue, right? Like they, they take in, I think 10% of Google's profits. I think they made like 15 billion or something two years ago. So, you know, YouTube is going to feed people what they want. It's, it's like a diet, right? So I would say like, you know, I'm not saying like, oh, the algorithm is evil. Like I'm just advocating for more of a, a sidestepping of that algorithm. So don't like, don't give YouTube the satisfaction of clicking on the first video that shows up because there's an ad on that video and they want you to watch that ad and they want you to wait five seconds before you skip the ad. So I, I'm just a big advocate of, of um, sort of, you know, working your way around, around those things. Cause I mean, YouTube is, is, it's, the power is in, is more or less, I think in some ways it's a, a struggle between the corporation and the viewer, right? So if the viewers can sort of, you know, not let the corporation budge them around, um, there's a lot of power in that, so. Yeah, there's, there's so much to think about there. Um, thanks, Jade, for the great question. We do have one, I think this question will be a little easier. You probably, you might even know off the top of your head, Boyce. Um, this is from Brian Jeffs and Brian writes, hey Boyce, during the course of your research, exactly how many versions of Third Construction did you watch? Oh man, I, Brian is someone I also know. So hey, Brian, it's, it, I would say it's good to see you, but I can't right now. But uh, <laughs> um, let's see. So the interesting thing, and this is not really a big phenomenon with, um, you know, recordings of percussion repertoire, but 
you know, the early days of YouTube where a video would go viral and then after a while people would make duplicates of it. Um, and then of course you'd have to look on YouTube for, you know, uh, you know, David after the dentist original, right? Like not, not giving credit to the guy that, you know, uh, illegally downloaded it from YouTube and posted it on his own channel. So there's only for third construction, when I sort of compiled all of the things together and the way that I did this actually was I made a playlist um, and it's available. So every third construction recording that's on YouTube is in a playlist that I've compiled. And I sort of extrapolated that data into a spreadsheet and uh, I can't, I think I found like 119 results and then there were only a couple of duplicates. So that sort of whittled it down to like numbers of actual performances. Um, there were a couple of videos, you know, in the early days of YouTube, they had the 10 minute time limit. So there are a couple of videos that are split between two uploads. Um, so I think that the number as of September 1st, 2021, because as soon as I wrote that in stone, it all changed. But um, the number of performances of third construction that are on there are, I think it's like 107 or 109. I can't remember exactly, but there's a lot, there's a ton. Um, but uh, yeah, so 107, I don't know why it took so long to explain that. <laughs> oh, it's interesting. I wonder, I wonder if like 10 or 15 years down the road, how many there will be. I don't know. I mean, if people know the number now, they're like, ah, there's no point. Like, who knows? I mean, the only way to find out really is just to, to dig and to find out. And yeah, a lot, some of the work I did for this was like, it felt kind of lame, but you know, now someone was telling, a friend was saying like, oh, now it can be on like trivia night at PAS, you know, and you'll be the person that provided that answer. Of how many, how many performances of third construction exist on YouTube? So yeah, I, I think fine. like it, I mean, just to like talk about something we talked about earlier, like how many recordings of Yellow After the Rain are there? There's like pieces like that. There's a, a billion because every, I don't know, eighth, ninth grade student plays that and all of them have phones and all of them want to be on YouTube. So <laughs> I think for, for younger students that are maybe working on pieces like that and like that Vic Firth repertoire library, literature library, whatever they call it. Uh, like the goal of that was like, if you see a recording in there, it's going to be a good recording. And, and it's so easy to find a thousand recordings of an Eric Samut fourth rotation or something like that. And so the Vic Firth thing, I think, was was a, a good idea to make sure like if it has this stamp on it, you know, it's at least of a certain level of quality. I was going to say it could reignite some, you know, I don't want to say like beef because it's not it's not really a sort of thing, but there is a bit of a, you know like uh i don't want i don't want animal see there's not enough words to really accurately i think portray but there's you know i think there's some things to sort of unpack with this idea of like the stamp of approval like you know it's obviously they're going to put out stuff that you know is is very high level and high caliber i think that the issue that i have with this idea of like crowdsourcing and this idea of like authority or a seal of approval is that i, I don't want younger people to think that that's the template for um, success. And I don't mean success and performance. I mean, just like personal success, like this idea of, of being able to really value yourself and know that you can be successful if you, you know, choose not to just emulate someone else. So it's, you know, it, you got to take it with a grain of salt. So as much as Vic Firth, I mean, they're the most dominant YouTube channel out of every percussion company. Um, there's a reason for that, but they also, you know, like, they got in the game very early on. Um, sometimes the internet is about who's first, always not necessarily what's accurate or what's right. So I think you just have to be mindful of those things um, because there's a couple of students that I've, I've had where I'll listen and I, I can tell them, you know, they played something. I said, you saw this video, didn't you? And they go, How, how'd you know? And it's like, well, I know because you're, you know, you're, you're basically cutting and pasting someone's expression and, and making it your own I mean to me that's sort of that's sort of antithetical to being a performer so um yeah I didn't mean to like go on a rant but that's just one little thing like you know all the stuff is not exclusive to YouTube though right like like all the stuff we've been saying about visual performance and like how certain visual things are appealing like I feel like you could compare the 4k video preference to like a better seat in the house 
uh, the audio quality to like a better instrument, a better performer. Like it'd be interesting to see like, well, how many of these things are just YouTube specific and not just this is shining a light on performance critique. It's like, yeah, your, your movement and your expression, like would they have that same takeaway from, uh, from a live performance as well? Like I, I would think it would be the same. I know like certain things don't come across as well on a video. They tend to always come across better live. I know for me, there are several compositions of mine that YouTube just doesn't sell them. Like you can't, a video doesn't do it. And I don't think it's because of video. I think it's because the payoff isn't until like eight minutes in. And the great thing about a live performance is they're there in their seat. They will sit there for till the eighth minute and then they'll go like, whoa, this piece is cool. I had no have idea. You been, that's have you been at PASIC? Because people just. <laughs> <laughs> they just roll on out. Well, my crowds are so little, Ben, that when some, you can't just get up and leave, <laughs> like, like you're going to be noticed. But I think about like, like I have a, I have like my, my piece, the big audition is just solo symbols and text playback. Like it's, it's, a, I think it's a really good piece, but YouTube's not selling it. Like there's no eye candy. There's no catchy lick. There's no thing in the quick 10 seconds that's going to go like, ooh, and keep you watching. Because as we know, you know, people like they engage so little with YouTube videos, they rarely watch them all the way through. It's like why well, TikTok is a thing. It's just like, hey, short, quick, funny, fast, fast, fast. Ben, by the way, I just did some research using a filter. Guess how many yellow after the rain videos were uploaded in the last month? 500? I, don't know. I have no idea. Four. <laughs> I was going to say four. 17, four. Not many, $3. yeah, four. There Not was two in, two in the last week and four in the last month. Well, they're going to get another one tonight. <laughs> We're all going to do one tonight. Four more. All right, well, boys, this has been really fun. Thanks so much for sharing your research with us. Um, I appreciate it and wish you all the best in the future. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thank appreciate you. It.